Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Christian. I'm an alcoholic. And um, my sobriety date is August 7, 2001. And as a result of this program, you know, crazy guys like like Jerry and, and good groups like the Primary Purpose Group, you know, I, I've been blessed to be sober. And uh, something I didn't think I was going to be able to do. And ah, I hate podiums. I hate speaking. <laughs> I really do. As much as I do it, I, I, I hate doing it. Um, no, 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 no. Trust me, you don't need to see me, like, bucking my legs and all that crazy stuff. And, um, <sighs> the primary purpose group does an amazing thing. Uh, they do what Alcoholics Anonymous did in the beginning, before it was Alcoholics Anonymous. Back when it was just a raggedy bunch of drunks in Akron and, and New York City, you know, the nameless bunch of drunks and the, the alcoholic squad of the Oxford group. And these guys got together and they did the impossible. They were staying sober a day at a time. They were getting through paychecks sober. They are getting through marriages and divorces sober, through births and deaths sober. They were doing it with a high level of grace and dignity. They were, we cuss? They were fuck knuckles. They were absolute maniacs. They were wide open. They were fools, and they were absolutely shameless in what they did. And they were promoting the hell out of themselves, and they were extravagant and enamored. I mean, everything about what they did was wrong. And thank God they started to write some of this stuff down and learn from their own experiences. And it gave birth in what we call the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And in the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous, they basically paved the path for people like me to show up here in 2001 and find what works. Not what we think might work, not some good intentions, but an actual blueprint. Um, they, it's the scientific method. It can be replicated. This wasn't something created in a lab by a couple of wild geniuses that can't be replicated by the average person like me. This is something that will work for anybody who stumbles in here and is willing to give it a shot. And all of us do it badly. That's the best thing about it. I remember a guy handed me a fourth step, and he was like handed it to me like it was his master thesis. You know, it was just like, here you go. And I was like, all right, you know. I mean, it was single space typed. I mean, it was indented. It was gorgeous, man. You know, it was like it would probably make a great bestseller. It was actually not one of the better fourth steps I've ever read. You know, I mean, it was just, it was like, because it was, it was <sighs> what we as alcoholics do. It was too much. It wasn't honest, you know. And we were talking about honesty before the meeting, and um, and thank you for having a greeter at the door. It's one of the best positions we got in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, back in the day, they used to call them sniffers. Because they would pull you in real close and find out if you've been drinking, if you've been drinking. <laughs> they made sure another member of AA was sitting next to you. Um, but, um, you know, the greeter is one of the great things. I'm still a greeter today. Um, since I've been sober, I've been greeting and making coffee, uh, setting up meetings. And uh, I don't know if service work has something anything to do with being sober for a long time in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm still doing it, and I'm still sober. So I don't know if there's a correlation there. The scientific method, I'm sure. But um, it helps to have a first drink, so I'll get to that one. Um, so uh, I'll be uh, be 44 in September. Um, I didn't think I was going to make it this far. I really didn't think I was going to make it out of my 20s. And, you know, as I was shaving my face, and anybody who knows me knows I rarely am clean shaven, I was looking in the mirror, I was like, there you are. Is that like a guy in his 20s? And then I looked at my hairline, I was like, there's that 43-year-old. <laughs> um, but I felt this, like, overwhelming sense of gratitude because um, I wasn't supposed to make it. I wasn't going to make it out of my 20s. Um, I'm the oldest of three. My parents uh, moved around a lot. My dad worked for Delta Airlines, and so they're headquartered here. And so what we got here in 1983, it was one of those things. It was like, this is the last move. So we could finally set down some roots. And um, I went through middle school here and high school. And um, I was a little squeaky kid. I was four feet nine up until I went through puberty, which... Uh, for me, it was late, and I hate waiting for anything, and uh, everybody else seemed to be going through puberty faster. They had hair on their body in places I couldn't even imagine, you know, and the stuff was growing on them, getting bigger and taller, and their voices were getting really deep, and, and I hated every one of them because they were different than me. I looked like a kid. They started looking like grown-ups, and, uh, and then it happened. The miracle of alcohol, of alcohol happened. I was at a party. It was right before Thanksgiving, and I got an opportunity to shotgun a beer. And this was my very first real drink. I had sips of sips of brandy from my mom's snifter, or, or sips of you know like a beer from my dad's beer, or something like that. But apparently, if you take a pen, 
scientific, pay attention. For those who don't know, I'm going to teach you how to drink here. All right, if you pop it in the bottom of the can, one fill swoop up, it all rushes down to your stomach. It's a very efficient way to deliver alcohol to an alcoholic. I didn't know I was an alcoholic yet. All right, I would have been doing the pop of beer thing for years before this if I had had it. But the thing was, is like I felt this weird splash in the bottom of my stomach. Unlike Kool-Aid or iced tea, it had this whole different feel. It wasn't cold. It was, it was warm. And as it started to rise up the middle of my back and my shoulders spread, and I felt this like strange tingling sensation as I was suddenly six foot five. I'm looking down and I'm towering above everything below me. You know, my voice suddenly went from little squeaky to very deep. And I felt like very white. I had this strange confidence and the security about me that I didn't possess prior to that moment. I was the class clown before then. I was the damn know-it-all in the corner. I mean, I was pretty smart. I, I did good at grades. I didn't have to work that hard on it. But I, but I felt always different. And the fact that I was four foot nine prior to this moment, and the fact that I had never had a drink before, and I didn't have hair growing on my body yet, I was, those were all things that were just symptoms of my disease. And when alcohol hit my stomach and everything changed in that moment, and I went from being uncomfortable to comfortable, I went from feeling insecure to very confident. And all of that happened in an instant. Now, it actually turned out there was about a beer and a half, but it sure felt like a moment in time. And that moment in time, I was going to chase for the next 16 years of my life. All right. So I went from being a pretty much a straight A student in freshman year of high school to deciding to drop out of high school. All right. Because when I was 17 and the Grateful Dead were coming through town, it just seemed like a good idea. Um, and so I did. Uh, and I dropped out, uh, did a bunch of geographic cures, ended up living over in Shambly, my very first apartment. It was a 900 square foot apartment, four guys. Uh, it was $410 uh, a month was our rent total. I had a difficulty coming up with $102.50 a month. That's how much my portion of rent was. So we were late on rent all the time, mostly because of me. Now, $102.50, and this was, what, 20-something years ago, uh, uh, almost 20 years ago? The reality was is that that wasn't hard to come up with. But I couldn't keep money in my pocket. I couldn't keep the paycheck. I couldn't pay my bills. I was very, very, uh, what's the word, impulsive with my money. I found this uh, non-habit-forming vegetative alcohol that I like to put into these non-habit-forming vegetative alcohol tubes. And uh, you put the water or whatever, golden grain or whatever you may have in the Southern Comfort. It was a very popular thing. And we would then smoke this non-habit-forming vegetative alcohol through this tube. And apparently don't, don't cough into the tube. You know, anybody knows what these things, I think we call them bongs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They got all this other shit now, and I can't even understand this other stuff. Back then, we, had, we were pure. It was toilet paper, uh, you know, uh, zigzags, or a bong. And that, so I, I found out that when I smoked that stuff and I was drinking on top of it, it enhanced my buzz, and I wanted that. And then I found out about trips that you take without ever leaving the room. You know, did a lot of those, which helped because I wanted to go on tour with the Grateful Dead. And I, and I did. I loved going on tour with the Grateful Dead, so I'm told. Uh, not really sure what happened. Uh, a lot of I spent a lot of time in the parking lot outside the show. Not a lot of time in the show. So I don't know if I was a deadhead or if I was just a drug addict or an alcoholic. You know, <laughs> but I like sure like to drink all the stuff they were brewing, and I like to smoke all the stuff they were passing, and I like to do all the things that they were doing. To this day, the smell of patchouli brings up this weird, like almost PTSD response in me. Um, and is and, and I had a great time. And then that was done, and came back to Atlanta. And, Decided, I was like, Atlanta sucks, so we moved to Columbia, South Carolina. Lived there for about six hours. It sucks. So we moved to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and then lived there for a little while. And then moved up to Wilmington, North Carolina, and then that sucked. And then moved all the way over to Clemson, South Carolina, and that sucked. Did all this in a year. Lived in five different places in three states in a year. And I came back to Atlanta, and I was introduced to another form of alcohol. I'll just say that's a very speedy kind of alcohol, and you can do a whole lot of drinking while you're speeding on this alcohol, and Jerry and I have a very cool connection to this particular one. It's actually the fellowship we met in, and um, and, I, I, and I went from being very um, houseable, I guess that's the word, houseable, you know, and very employable to very unemployable and very homeless. Um, I didn't really look at it as being homeless. It was almost like urban camping. You know, it's like, you know, it's not really homeless if it's, if it's not cold outside, right? And it's not really homeless if there's a library that lets you come in and bathe in their toilet, you know, or, or bathe in near their sink. Or, and it's not really homeless if you can get a meal every now and then. I was homeless. And so I did homelessness for 19 months. And, um, and I had absolutely no reason to be homeless. Other than the fact that I was an alcoholic and had a really, really, really busy drug habit, you know, and I just couldn't not drink. I couldn't not stay sober. For whatever reason in me, I just, I don't understand 
it, it, like I could fathom the idea of stopping, but I couldn't ever experience staying stopped. I was a better starter than I was a stopper, you know, and I don't know if that makes sense to anybody. It's like, but I would like lift up my hand to God and say, I swear I'm not going to do this again. And I could remember that I just said that prayer like that morning, you know, that I wasn't going to do what I did last night, but I ended up doing it again and I am doing it again. And at some point in time, it's like, I just stopped praying. You know, I would pray for shelter. I would pray for warmth. I would pray for clothes. I would pray that that guy who didn't put 50 cents in my hat, you know, would trip over the crack in the sidewalk. You know, that one, by the way, was answered right off. You know, that was a menacing crack in the sidewalk. Um, but, you know, I had all these uh, just uh, so much, I don't know how to describe it. It wasn't angst. It wasn't anger. It was just this, like, hostility. You know, it was just, it's like everybody rubbed me the wrong way. I, I guess the best words would be restless irritable, discontent. And I didn't understand those words. I wasn't going to know them for another couple of years. I came into, into recovery the first time in 1998 after a failed suicide attempt. Oh, by the way, I have to explain. Uh, from the time I was 14 until I was uh, 25, I had uh, five suicide attempts. So I'm a really lousy suicider too, I guess. That, right. Is that a word? Um, thank God I didn't succeed. Uh, I tried, and I should have succeeded on a number of occasions, but those are different stories. And I, I, I don't knock suicide. At all. I don't. I think it's just the obvious end we end up with. You know, whether you die with a bottle in the hand or eating a bullet, I think that's just where our disease takes people. And it's really unfortunate. And a lot of them have had the privilege of coming into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and they either didn't hear the message or we weren't sharing the message. And another prop to the primary purpose group because they adhere to what it is we do. We carry this message to those who suffer from alcoholism. That's our primary purpose. Um, so I came in the first time in 1998, and um, and uh, I, I did a 14-day detox, which I thought was normal. It's not a normal detox. I was pretty nasty when I came in. They scrubbed me down because I had stuff living on me, apparently. I, I wasn't houseable, but my body was uh, houseable for many things. Um, you know, I lost a bunch of teeth doing stuff over in the bluff with people who created the game. I thought I could beat them at the game. You can't beat them at the game. They wrote the rules. Um, and there's more of them than there are you. And, um, and they don't fight fair. And, um, and when I got to uh, the Salvation Army, which is where I was going to go because I had no job and I had no place to go, and nobody really seemed to care about me. And the only interaction I've had with another human being who cared anything about me was staring down the aisle, and this is after my last suicide attempt, uh, was staring down the aisle outside the emergency room door and seeing my mother in tears, my brother shaking his head with so much contempt towards me, and my sister racing to get there from out of town. And that's, that's, that's what I put my family through. And you know what I told myself, the lie I told myself, is that they're better off not knowing how bad it is. They're better off not knowing. I don't want them to worry. My mom hadn't heard from me in almost seven months at that point in time. She was frantic. I'd probably robbed my mom of 10 years of her life, just the amount of stress that I placed on her. But I didn't know that because, again, I was selfish and self-centered. Because the core of my problem is that I didn't care what you thought. I, I cared what I thought you thought, which is a little different than what you actually thought. I, if I'd ever bothered to ask you what you thought, you probably would have said something vastly different than what I was thinking. But, um, and I couldn't hear past the end of my own head. And I don't know if that makes sense. It's like the outside world was deafened by how loud it was in my own head. And what it was in my head was like, we're going to drink. You're going to need to drink. As a matter of fact, if you don't drink, we're going to have a problem. You know, and I hear, see, you got all these great problems, you like uh, these great uh, goals. You want to go to college. You want to maybe meet somebody and get in a relationship, maybe buy a home, maybe have a future. Yeah, but we're going to be drinking while all of those are going to be failed. You know, the only thing that I ever did successfully for 16 years is drink and get high. It's the only thing I did with any consistency, and I was successful at it. The problem is I wasn't successful at it because the more and more I tried to do it, the less and less relief I got. A very wise prophet used to say, uh, I used to do a little, and a little didn't do it, and a little got more and more. Because, see, remember, when it comes to certain things in life, the more you do, the more you enjoy. That's, that's, that's normal people. Normal people drinking, normal people partying, not for us, at some point in time, it takes a tremendous amount to get even. I'm not even getting high anymore. I haven't been drunk in years. Prior to my sobriety date, I couldn't remember the last time I had fun drinking. Mardi Gras. That was like four years prior to that. All right. So I come into recovery, and uh, they, they introduced me to the, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I thought it was just another book. Didn't want that one. 
uh, didn't want the other book that the Salvation Army had either. And um, and we went to these meetings, and the, the old-timers, you know, the guys of 90 Days, you know, they're holding down the middle of the meeting, keeping everybody sober in the middle. And, and I was one of the middle guys. I didn't know how to do get to that outside chair. Apparently, you have to stay sober forever because 90 Days is an eternity when you're brand in recovery. And... Um, and they were saying all this good stuff, like, listen, it's the first drink that gets you drunk. I was like, yeah. But they didn't tell you how to not take the first drink, by the way. You know, just don't drink, go to meetings. That was the prescription that they had for the first drink. And I watched a lot of people go out and then come back, go out and come back. And I came to believe, based upon what I was saying, that that's just what happens in recovery. Nobody makes it long term. Everybody's in and out. Everybody's in and out. And then some people just didn't come back. The down Rice Street, or Federal, or State, or the grave. You know? I never heard anybody coming back talking about how good it was. This was my first time. I hadn't really tried to quit and stay quit. I'd, I'd like tried to quit for a job interview, you know, and then, you know, it was too stressful for the job interview, so I had to go and drink, you know, and then I forgot about the job interview. Uh, you know, I didn't have anybody to keep it together for, and this was the first time, and I thought that if I just did what these guys were doing in here, talking the good talk, you know, as a, again, I apologize for any kind of profanity, but my first sponsor, Don, called me, he said, oh, you're one of them good sharing motherfuckers, ain't you? You ain't got shit to say, man, but you sure sound good, right? Because I had nothing. I had no substance. All I had was some quips that I heard from the, the, uh, the All Saints, you know, uh, rush hour relief group or from the, you know, the heavy hitters group, which I hadn't gotten to yet, by the way, that's an intimidating group to go to. But it was all these like open sharing meetings that I heard people talk stuff, good stuff, good stuff. I hadn't done any of it, but I could hear something and replicate it. You know, it's kind of like one liners or pickup lines, you know, nothing original, you know, but it was all stuff that was borrowed. And so I heard it. I thought, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. I have no idea what it means, but I'm going to share that. You know, I'd come into meetings. I'd be like, you know, acceptance is the answer, you know, and they'd be looking at me like, He's new. <laughs> He's new. He's new, man. I said it like I wrote it. I didn't realize it was in the book. By the way, I hadn't opened the book yet, all right? So I didn't know anything about recovery. Um, I didn't understand what my problem was. I thought alcohol was my problem. I really thought that it was just the alcohol and the drugs that were my problem. So I relapsed. 18 months dry, bone dry. I needed a drink worse than you can imagine. I, my body was screaming for a drink. And so when I picked one up, I didn't pick one up because I wanted it. I picked one up because it was just the next thing to do. For people like me, I don't consciously make a decision to drink and go get high. For people like me, it ends up in my hand and in my body. And I scratch my head and I beat the bar wondering how it happened again. And I can't understand. I can't fathom it. I had every reason not to do it, but yet I did it. Or I'm so pissed off and frustrated and I got the rids like you wouldn't believe. And I just, I beeline. Screw this, I'm out. Or as my first sponsor, Don, called it, the fuck it. You know? So I stayed uh, stayed drunk for a little over a year. I did very well for myself during that year. I didn't do anything like to brag about, so to speak, other than I was employee of the month at Ansley Golf Club. <laughs> <laughs> got to have goals. Got to have a goal, man. And that was my goal. And I got the plaque and I got the check for $250 and I got the little parking thing to hang on the vehicle that I did not own. And I got all this opportunity and praise and I had beer on my breath as I accepted these awards. And I, and I thought to myself, I, I've peaked. This is as good as my life is ever going to possibly get. And I've been drunk for over a year. That next day, August 7, 2001, I drank my last beer and I went back to the Salvation Army. And I knew a couple things now. Number one, I didn't understand what alcoholism was. I didn't understand it was a disease. I didn't understand it was genetic. I didn't understand that I'm somehow different than the normal drinker. I didn't understand that. I didn't understand that I'm going to, in spite of myself, drink. Step one doesn't say I can't drink. Step one says I'm going to drink. I'm powerless over alcohol. I've proven that to myself over the course of 16 years of active drinking and, and using. I'm powerless. I'm no more powerful today at 14 years sober than I was when I walked in August 7, 2001. I didn't know what this big book was. I had one. I hadn't read it yet. It made the weird noise when he opened it for the first time, <laughs> which really, because I, and I didn't realize the sponsors know sponsees a lot. All right. We think we're getting over on them a little bit, you know, and heads looking around the room a little bit here. Um, you know, I, they didn't, I didn't know that. I didn't know that they were going to automatically assume I'm being dishonest from the gate. So he, my sponsor, Don was like, so, Hey, how you been reading that big book? And I'd be like, oh, it's great. And I opened the big book in front of him and made that sound. He goes, yeah, you ain't been reading shit, man. You know, if you've been reading that big book, it wouldn't have made that noise. Now, the reality is, is like that was expected. 
I, I thought I'd let them down. You can't let a sponsor down. They have no expectations of it. They really don't. We have hopes, but we have no expectations. Expectations are nothing more than premeditated resentment. We know better because we work the steps ourselves, so that's the reason why we don't place expectations on others. You know? Now, don't get me wrong. Don't, we're not going to work if we try. We try a lot not to place expectations, but we learn that it's pointless. And so when my, I, let, I let my sponsor down. I thought he was going to fire me. And he, from what I understand, I hired him. All right, I can fire him. He can't fire me. Um, and he suggested I go to this meeting. I went to this meeting, and they weren't talking about the girl and the, the job and the car. They weren't talking about how bitch in life was sober. They were talking about working steps and getting sponsors and a powerful relationship with God. It was unlike any meeting I ever went. And then I made the mistake of sharing. Now, I mentioned the heavy hitters earlier. They found out very quickly that I didn't know shit about sobriety, and they told me to shut the fuck up. All right. Um, and they said it just like that. <laughs> man, man, shut the fuck up, man. You don't know shit, man. We know how to drink. You don't know how to get sober. And I was like, damn. But I went back, and I got my first sponsor there, and he introduced me to the big book. He introduced me to service work. He said, this is what we do. All right. He never, ever, ever said to me, this is what you're going to do. He said, this is what we do. And when I showed up doing the things that he in, encouraged me to do, he was already there doing it. He was there early, showing up, setting up meetings, making coffee, greeting people, breaking meetings down, carrying service commitments into de jails, detox, and prison. He was uh, sponsoring guys and being sponsored. He was on panels, and he was uh, had his service positions within the group. My sponsor taught me how to be an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous, not just go to meetings but to be an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he taught me the joy in being of service and the opportunities that were presented within service. Because some of the best stuff that will ever happen, happen before the meeting. Some of the best meetings I've ever had are 10 minutes after the meeting ends. You know, he taught me how to be 20 minutes early and stay 20 minutes late. You know, how to be accountable. And he taught me that accountability, and I've heard this one from Kip Collins, accountability means you do it or you die on the way to do it. You know, I'd never been accountable before. I'd never been responsible before. You know, I was always out for me, and what my sponsor showed me and taught me how to do is how to be out there for others. Now, I had this nagging problem called alcoholism, so we started working the 12 steps together, and it introduced me to the first step concept. Being powerless means I don't have the power. I'm powerless. I don't ever regain the power. You know, and then he used the pickle analogy. I hated the pickle analogy because I always wanted to be a cucumber again. Because, by the way, pickle, pickles... Cucumbers shrink when they become a pickle, all right? So I was already like, you know, like, I don't want, I don't want that one. No, I want to be a cucumber again, you know, because you never go back, you know. But what we can do is we can encourage you to seek diligently this path. And the more diligently you seek this path, the more comfortable you will be being a pickle, you know. And I hated the idea of being anything different. And I felt different in AA meetings until I stopped and I actually listened. And listen for me was a difference than I think than some people. Some people listen with their ears. My sponsor taught me to listen with my body and with my eyes, to actually turn and face the speaker who's sharing, to share, to turn and look at the person who's sharing, to actually see their body language, to see their face, to see their eyes, to witness the windows of their soul. Because see, that's when I'm going to connect with people. It's the language of the heart that happens when we sit knee to knee with each other and we share our common experience, strength, and hope with each other. There's a power in that. That this room didn't have jack for power until everybody started to show up here. And the more people showed up here, the more power showed up here. Any, any one of us don't have it, but it's kind of like a candle. You start bringing the candles together, the light, the flame, the brightness gets almost blinding. And that's what we get in these rooms. We get this bright light in the darkness of alcoholism that people can gravitate towards and can seek. They were a beacon in the bleak and, dear, and, and dark uh, wilderness of alcoholism. You know, And that's what we are. And individually, you know, we can illuminate the path and we can help drag somebody, drag. So we can sometimes drag it behind us, you know. But more often than not, is that we can just blaze the path and show them, this is what I'm doing. This is the life I'm living. And that's what my sponsor did for me. And he opened me up to the second step proposition. Because I'm going to need power. First step suggests that I'm, I'm without power. I'm, not gonna, I'm never going to get it back. And I didn't like that because that means I'm broken for good. And what he suggested is, okay, so we need a power good in ourselves. Now, I have a problem with that initially because my, my, uh, I grew up in a Roman Catholic and Southern Baptist home. My mom was Roman Catholic. My dad, my dad Southern Baptist. And there was a lot of friction when we came to talking about God in that home. Could never decide which church to go to. We go to my mom's church, and it's almost like this. It's very sacred. Did you know that you can actually hear somebody fart from an entire, all the way across the sanctuary at a Roman Catholic church? You can hear somebody mumble under their breath their little prayers. I didn't know that. It was a cacophony of, of echoes and sound, and, you know, and if I sat in the pew wrong, it emanated this huge noise. I was like, oh, God, I'm embarrassed enough already. And that's how I felt at eight years old. 
I never wanted to go back there because you got to like you got a trip or something when you, before you get in the pew, and I didn't know what that was about. And, and then you get on the begging bar, and they're all there, and they're counting beads, and I didn't have beads, and then everybody got up for juice and cookies at the end, and I didn't, I couldn't go. My mom said to me very politely, "Christian, you need to stay here. You haven't gone gone, gone through confirmation. You haven't gone through catechism. And it was all throughout all these C words. You know, I hadn't gone through any of them, so I couldn't go. And of course, they're all up there having like a feast. I didn't know what it was." But in my mind, it's juice and cookies, right? And, and it wasn't juice and cookies. I didn't understand the sacraments. I had no understanding of it. And I remember being there on one particular day. It was my mother's church she grew up in. It was a very small town in Olney, Olney Illinois, population 800. And it was this very, 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 very tight-knit community. And I'm the weird guy stuck in the pew. And it's like everybody's going up, and, they're, and then they're like this little girl looks back. And it's like, I can feel the judgment, you know, and I, and she wasn't, but in my head, she was like, mommy, is that that poor bastard is going to hell? You know? <laughs> Cause that's what I was. I was like, I'm not going, I can't go up. Whatever they're doing up there means that they've got something I'm never going to have. Now my dad's church was completely opposite. All right. And by the way, I got no opinions about either church today. That was just the perceptions of a young child who already felt different. I hadn't had my first drink yet. I needed it. But I hadn't had it yet. I just had a head full of alcoholism that wasn't treated yet. And by the way, alcohol treats alcoholism. It doesn't cause it. I had alcoholism before I had my first drink. I have alcoholism today. You know, Alcohol very effectively treats alcoholics. It very effectively kill, keeps us from killing ourselves. The problem is at some point it stops working. Hence the reason why we end up here. So in my dad's church, it was like a Southern Baptist church. You know, those Southern Baptist church, a very traditional Southern Baptist church. It was a lot of bake sales. There was a lot of frivolity. There was a lot of family. There was a lot of, I mean, my mom's church was dead quiet until the priest got to the, to the lectern, my, or whatever, the, the, the podium. Uh, you know, but at my dad's church, it was a town hall meeting. Everybody was having fun. Now, I felt weird at my mom's church. I hated my dad's church because I didn't know how to do what they were doing. They were talking about things like their lives. I didn't have a life. I was eight. You know, I didn't know nothing about nothing. You know, and the worst thing is I didn't know I didn't know nothing about nothing. I had nothing to offer. They would ask me questions I didn't have any answers to. Like, hey, how you doing? Shit. Oh, I don't know. I'm really feeling uncomfortable right now. And they would ask me things like, how is your school? Well, my school is great, but why do you want to talk to me about something that should be obvious to you? You know, because I thought it was like, why don't you know I'm smart? You know, it was like, don't you read the letter my mom sends out every year? You know, it's like, you know, it was just this feeling of like not ever fitting in. I didn't fit in at school. And so it was no wonder that when I drank that first beer, Friday after Thanksgiving, my freshman year in high school, that first real beer that hit my stomach and when it started to rise up in my body and it gave me confidence and courage and strength, it gave me wisdom beyond my years and it made me everything that I ever wanted to be, that I chased that. I didn't get drunk off one beer. That one beer opened the floodgates to an entire life that I didn't know was possible. So my sponsor suggested I'm going to need a power greater than myself, but I'm going to need a new power. I'm going to need a new understanding. I'm going to need a personal relationship with my own conscious understanding of God. And then he took me to a couple places in the book, and he says, no mind can comprehend or conceive the power that, that is God. It's impossible for any of us to fully define that, which was great news for me, because all I knew was the judgment. All I knew was unforgiveness. By the way, my parents' churches never, ever preached that. That's only what I heard. And if you can get down with hearing something that wasn't said, <laughs> you can relate to how I was as a child. Um, my brother and sister, they just they just got it. They just seemed to catch on to things a whole lot better than I did. And um, so he suggests I'm going to need a power greater than myself. I'm going to need a new concept and a new understanding, provided it makes sense to me. And so he introduced me to the concept and the idea of maybe creating my own higher power. Not me, but an understanding of a higher power. And he started me off on a third step assignment, which was basically create a one ad for God. You know, it's almost like a classified ad. And for those who were, don't know, we used to have these things called newspapers. And back then, you used to go looking for jobs. <laughs> back then, you used to just try to find a job, you'd circle it, and hopefully race down there to get there because you had to show up in person. And um, the, the whole thing was, is like basically wanted one higher power. And he introduces the idea of three words, all right? Omniscience, omni omnipotence, and omnipresence. All-knowing, all-powerful, and all places. And he says, write those at the top, and anything else after that that you want is yours. Something that you're going to feel comfortable talking to God about. 
So I started off with things like music. Jimmy Page is God. The best jazz is, you know, you know, Charles Mingus and Thelonious Monk. John Tesh is crap. You know, it's like, a, must be willing to speak to me through art and literature. Must be willing to show up in sunsets. And, and, and dew drops on the, on the leaves, you know, things that I could see, things that I could hear, the whisper in the winds, you know. But if I, my life's on the line and my, my ass is going to die, please crack me over the head with a two-by-four, you know. And, I, and I, I sat down with this idea, this concept of God that I wrote on paper, and I went to go show it to him, and he didn't care. He said, that's yours. Pray to that. So I started praying to this piece of paper. It felt weird. I didn't like the idea of praying, because for me, praying always felt like begging. I didn't understand that a conscious communication, a, a relationship, a conversation that I could possibly have with God. I ended up having another sponsor years later who introduced me to a book by a guy named Neil Donald Walsh, and it's not conference-approved literature, but this concept of a conversation with God was something that I had never thought of, that I could actually have a conversation with God, you know? There was, it wasn't biblical. It wasn't testament. It wasn't, it wasn't theology or doctrine. It was something new. It was like this new idea. Thank God for AA. We're full of new ideas in here. They're all stuff we stole shamelessly from other places, you know, but we, you know, we, here, here, try this. Holy shit. Wow. That's new. You know, so, uh, I started praying to this thing and we did a third step prayer in the parking lot of the Triangle Club and I was embarrassed to do it. And he suggested to me, Christian, these people have basically been stepping over you for years. Why are you going to care what they think now? And I did my third step prayer. He was on his knees too. We held hands and we said this prayer. Um, and again, I hadn't read ahead. All right. I didn't realize we were about to embark on a fourth step. Had I known that, I would have hovered at three forever. All right. <laughs> trying to figure out three. And he says, three is a conscious decision. All right. Three basically catapults me into a need to do some inventory. All right. So the way I always looked at the first three steps initially was like, uh, what's my problem? Lack of booze was my problem. All right. What's the solution? Booze. Third step was basically getting the cart and go into the liquor store. It's the same thing. What's my problem? Lack of power. I'm going to die from a disease that I, that I at times, don't believe I have. Uh, and I'm going to need a power greater than myself to restore me to sanity so I see my disease for what it is, a life-threatening illness, a mental illness that I will never, ever escape, but I can put to rest and deal with effectively. Third step is really just making the decision to do something about it. But it sounds very simple. It's like, I'm just going to decide to go do it. But there's a lot more going on in here. The first thing I, the, is that I have to quit playing God. I didn't understand how I played God. Passing judgment, kind of like some of you are with me right now. You know, taking somebody's inventory. Having an opinion about what should or shouldn't happen. Getting upset with somebody when they don't think, do things the way I think they should do them. All of these things. I didn't realize the selfishness and self-centeredness was the problem that I had. You know, the, in the big book, and this is prior to television, so Bill, Bill Wilson wrote what he knew. He was in New York. They weren't that far from the theater district. So he talks about, you know, the alcoholic is like the actor, forever trying to arrange the lights of ballet and the scenery in his own way. If only the players would do as they told, if only the things would stay put, life would be great. Now, I can look at it the same way. I'm the same way. I look at it like I'm the director. Problem is, I'm not the director. I'm just another actor. And I want to arrange the lights, the ballet, and the scenery, what it looks like, where it's happening, what's going on. I want to look at it. And I want to take inventory with how the chairs are set up. I want to take inventory with how my employer is divvying out bonuses at the end of the year. I want to take exception with how somebody loads the dishwasher at Fleming's one, I, one evening while I was working there. You know, I have all these opinions. And, and, and the problem is I'll actually get upset over the fact that somebody doesn't care about what my opinion is. You know? And, and not to get off topic too far, but you know, we're living in a country right now with a lot of people who have a lot of opinions, and there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of hostility about a lot of things. Any jackass can say anything and get a reaction. Not here. AA is one of the very few places that you can come into and you can share, and it has no political affiliation, no religious affiliation. We don't, we're not connected with that. We don't care about that. And here it's about recovery from alcoholism. It's one of the true democratic places that it really exists anymore. So I started doing inventory after I did the third step. And I came back to the third step many, 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 many times over the last seven or eight years. Um, 60 through 63 is a go-to for me, you know, because being convinced that I'm powerless over my disease, my life has become unmanageable, that no human power can relieve me of my disease, and that God could and would if he were soft. Being convinced is that I have some things I have to do. If I can't see the need for God, I won't seek it. If I can't, and more importantly, if I can't see the need for help with a disease that's going to kick me, I'm, I'm in trouble. 
And so that's, I think, where we lose a lot of people in AA is because they don't, they don't, they don't get a healthy diagnosis for alcoholism. They don't ever hear us at times, depending on meeting, talk about God. There's actually meetings in, 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 in different parts of the country where you can't talk about God. They actually banned God from AA meetings. Not the healthiest group of alcoholics, but again, that's me taking their inventory. Um, but when I start looking at what the third step promotes for the fourth step is that I need to look at me. It, you know, Michael Jackson said, if you want to make the world a better place, take a look in the, take a look in the mirror. Take a look at yourself. I can't change them. What I can do is I can start a change in me. But I don't know where to start. It's too much. I want to eat the elephant all at once. Well, my sponsor suggested us looking at three areas, resentments, fears, and sexual misconduct and harms to others. Let's look at these basic areas, resentment being the number one offender. And resentment steals from me the ability to be present because I'm angry about something that just happened or guilty about something that just happened or feeling shame about something that just happened or happened long ago or I'm fearful about what might. I can't be present in my own life. I'll be sitting in the middle of Shangri-La and I'm lamenting the loss of that place back there or worried about how long will this place last. I can't be present. I can't enjoy my own life. And if I can't enjoy my own life and be present in my own life, I'm going to drink because that's what I do. I'll eventually become so restless here to discontent that I need to drink. I won't think it's a good idea. I'll just drink because that's what I do. We lose a lot of people in our sister fellowships, unfortunately, right now because of that very thing. HA and CA, a lot of people are struggling because we need more powerful messages like this. Um, but more powerful messages like this, not me, the big book about Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, so I did, went and did a fifth step after I wrote out all this inventory. And again, it was a Pulitzer Prize winning fourth step. And, um, and, and I went to go share it with my sponsor. And, um, and he invited God to sit with us. And I felt really weird. All right, and we were at a place called the, the Atlanta Men's Workshop. We were sitting by a lake. I was sitting on a log. He was sitting on a log. We invited God to sit on the stump. I don't know if he sat there or not, but there was a hawk that landed on a branch and it stayed there in the entire six hours that we were doing this thing. Um, that's just a detail. I have no attachment to the bird, uh, but it was pretty cool that he hung out there the whole time. I kept looking up, wondering, you know, waiting on him to shit on me or something. And he never did because um, I figured I deserved it. Uh, but then I shared these things and I shared in detail and I didn't, I didn't attempt, even though I tried in the beginning of the fifth step, I tried to want to like, kind of like, you know, let him know that the only reason I did this stuff or the only reason I feel this way. And he's like, no, 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 let's just talk about what's on your paper. Let's just share that. This is about us just talking. And I realized that what I was doing was pulling back the sword and the shield. I was pulling back the armor and I was allowing somebody to get to know me. I was understanding what the word intimacy meant for the very first time. That was going to pave the way for so much growth in my life is intimacy. I didn't try to be all big and bad. I didn't try to be, it never was. You know, <laughs> but I, but our ego sometimes will tell us that we need to be strong. We need to be big and bad. You know, can't let anybody get too close. Can't let them see you sweat. Always act like you got it going on. I see a few heads nodding on that one. I think I'm hitting home on some people here. So I did this thing and I love that with some of the big step, you know, fifth step promises, you know, the book suggests that we can be alone at perfect peace and ease. And I found out that there's a difference between being alone and being lonely. Because I had always felt lonely in a room full of people. I would feel lonely. At my own parties, I felt lonely. And I realized that I could be alone without feeling lonely, and I didn't understand that. Um, I could look the world in the eye. I was a shoe guy when I got here. You know, I couldn't dare look people in the eye. Because if I looked you in the eye, then you could tell how I was. You could sense the BS that was just streaming out of my mouth. You could feel the dishonesty and the, and the, and, and the fraudulence that I, that I embodied at that point in time. Um, I couldn't have told you what was real about me and what wasn't. Um, the fourth step really helped me learn a lot about who I really was, not about who I pretended to be. And more importantly, it gave me an idea as to like how I normally react in any given situation that upsets me. My MO, if you will. You know, I learned how I react. You know, I thought I had like, you know, the old joke. You know, I thought I had 30 bad relationships. Uh -uh, I had the same one 30 times. You know, I always either gave them a reason to leave or left myself. You know, I, I always uh, left a job before I got really promoted. You know, I'd always do really well to move up, but I could never get to that golden brass ring, and somehow it was their fault. And I always left, and I always felt this, like, sense of, like, entitlement, but, like, I guess we talk about it here as, like, grandiosity coupled with an inferiority complex, you know? And I don't know how you're supposed to feel comfortable sober like that. Um, and I, I moved into step six and seven, and six and seven really opened up the door for me because it was not about me stopping being an asshole. You know, it was more about me recognizing I'm an asshole, and if I hope to be anything better than that, I'm going to need God's help in it. 
you know, and I became entirely willing to let go of these things and move towards something better. And seven, I love it when I hear people talk about working on their defects of character. You know, it's like I'm working on my dishonesty. My sponsor suggested the alternate to me, and, uh, and I've had a great bunch of great sponsors. Don B was my first sponsor, a guy named Bill Adams who passed, who died from cancer. He was my second sponsor, and a guy, guy named Art, Art S. is the one who introduced me to this idea. And he says, Christian, it's not about lying less. It's about being honest more. He says, it's not about stealing less, it's about paying for things more. You know, and I realized that there was a, I'm t- actually practicing the spiritual action instead of attempting to stop the, you know, the, the character defect. And I realized that if, if I'm still paying attention to my defects of character, they're not old behaviors. They're current behaviors, you know. And so I realized that as I'm moving through this, and it wasn't like realization, like my, my head popped out of my ass one day, and I was like, oh, that's it. You know, that's so simple. No, it was more like a realization when I look back. Like in the big book, it suggests when we look back, we realize the things which came to us when we placed ourselves in God's hands were better than anything we could have done. I had to put all my hopes and dreams into God's hands. I didn't know what was going to happen. Now, this was all in my first year of sobriety. I'm all the way up through seven and starting to work steps eight and nine. And uh, my second sponsor, um, Bill Adams, died on June 23rd, um, uh, 19, uh, 2002. And I was at Petra DeCab Airport, and I'm in the process of making my ninth step amends, and I got the phone call that he had died. And he was in hospice for two days. He was dying from cancer. He was a funny old queen. God bless him. Uh, I didn't know he was a queen when I, when I asked him to sponsor me. And I went over to his place the first time, and, and he had a, a bunch of nice bookshelves and a bunch of nice books and these big brass pen, penis bookends, you know, which, you know, it was art. You know, I didn't know. I didn't think anything. But I couldn't escape the big six-foot-tall glen that the Good Witch of the North cut out in the corner, you know. And I, if you know anything about Wizard of Oz, it's a very pink frilly dress, and she was six foot tall right in the corner. You couldn't escape that one. I go back to the brass bookshelves, and I'm, oh, God, dicks. And hmm. I looked at him. I was like, Bill, are you gay? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, oh, he goes, I hope so. I got a lot of gay shit. And I was like, oh. <laughs> uh, and the reality is, it's like, I didn't know I had a problem with, with gay men. I didn't know that. And I didn't have a problem with gay men. I had, a, like, a, an opinion. Not formed on any kind of real information, no, no experience. I just had an opinion. It's one of the challenges of growing up in, I guess, a, like a typically conservative upper class white neighborhood. You know, my dad had opinions, and he shared his opinions with me. Another great gift of inventory, by the way. Find out where your damn opinions come from. You know, we pick up a lot of junk from a lot of people who don't mean us any well. You know, they some of them do, but a lot of times they don't. You know, a lot of times they're just sharing their opinion. My mom had a problem with race uh, with black people for the longest time in her life because she grew up in a very small town in Illinois, and there was 800 people in that town. And up until she was 23 years old, she hadn't seen a black person except on television, you know, and they're in their 70s now. So her brother went into Chicago. He had not met one black person yet. The first one he met mugged him. So now he has 100% experience that black people are going to mug you. And he brought that back to the farm. So guess how many people in my mom's nine, nine, not seven children, parents, relatives all around. Everybody now has an opinion of black people. They haven't met one. They just now have an opinion of one based upon one person's experience one time. And the thing was, is a lot of us come in here with broken hearts and broken and broken spirits. And we wonder how they got that way. Now, alcoholism doesn't kill us. Before it brings us in here, it just makes life so unbearable that we have to drink. And in here, if we don't do the work, it will continue to do that. It will rob us of the joys that we find in early sobriety. That pink cloud, that pink cloud's grace, man. That pink cloud's this feeling of connectedness for the first time in a long time. That pink cloud is this experience we get to come in and, and feel a part of. We, What is it I felt at that meeting? I don't know. But I want to go back, you know? I never really got into the bar. I got it in the bottle. But even that bottle started to fade after a while. And it's like the more I come back and go to roundups and retreats and workshops and hang out with my sponsor and my sponsees, hang out with people in this fellowship, I get this weird connectedness that I don't get anywhere else. Y'all get me, unlike anybody else in this world. So I made this list of amends that I needed to make. And I started to make them. And I remember my mom, for example, I'll give you just an example. I remember sliding some money across to my mom. I had saved up as much as I could possibly save up, and I'd robbed her blind. And I put down a dollar amount. That was my amends to mom. Sorry, and here's the money, right? That's what I thought. And I'm going to hopefully promote the idea of face-to-face amends are amazing. Because, see, I really didn't know how I'd hurt my mom. I really didn't know. I thought I'd spared her all the gory details. I would tell her a little bit about my life when I was out there. 
pay her the money back, she'll be happy, everything's good. No. <laughs> she basically pushed the money back when I pushed it over to her. Uh, and I don't know what your experience is with people who give money back to you. They're going to take it out of your ass. They want something else. And she did. She laid into me and she let me know exactly how it hurt her. And over the course of six and a half, seven months, she had called over 13 counties, four states, 29 municipalities to try to find her. Because I was sparing her the horrific nature of my life by not telling her how I was doing. I was sparing her the pain of how bad my life was. And what I did is I robbed her of, of my life. She was worried to death, you know, places that she called multiple different times, hospitals, jails, um, uh, drug and alcohol detoxes, morgues. That's always a good, fun phone call. Do you have any bodies there by the, you know, when she would try to remember as much detail about my body, birthmarks or anything like that, anything that she could share in order to try to find her, her little boy. I was her first, you know, I was the first, I'm the oldest. And so as I, she tells me all that, and by the way, that's where I felt the experience of the amends process, the real healing of the amends process. She then did take the money. Right? <laughs> she, she, really, she, ain't, she ain't a fool. She took that money. And then she let me pay her back little by little as much as I could. She let me come over to her house and, and mow her yard and, and, and do things for her around the house. And I remember the first day when, you know, you, you think about what we lost when we're out there. We don't realize that some of them are tangible. But this, I think it's more the intangibles that we get back that we realize mean more. Like, I remember when I got trust back, and it happened on an August afternoon, and I was just about a year sober at this point, uh, just over a year sober, and it was hot outside, and I was doing yard work, and I go inside. Now, um, from the time I was about six until I was about 30, <laughs> my mom had taken her purse with her everywhere she went. If I was in the county, that purse was on her person, right? If I was in the house and there was a table full of people, she would get up with her purse whether she needed it or not, because it was a learned behavior for her. If it was there on the table, it was fair game for me. And I stole and robbed her blind every chance I could. And I come into the house, which was unlocked after doing yard work, and the purse is on the table. And I'm thinking she's probably dead on the floor because there's no way that the two are separated. And I, I said, Mom, and I could hear her in the living room. She said, what? And I said, are you okay? And she said, yeah. And I said, you know, your purse is in here. And she goes, yeah, I know. I trust you. And I had breached that trust somewhere around eight or nine years old when I first started honing my dishonesty. You know, and now I'm getting it back at almost 30 years of age, and it blew my mind. I remember getting integrity back. You know, I remember the uh, helping a guy get uh, signed up for a workshop, and the the guy who was checking off names, people who had paid. He looked down uh, after there was a discrepancy between the two, and I come over to this guy and I tell him, I said, "Listen, look, he paid." And he, the guy looks at me and he says, "If you say so." And I remember turning around to tell the guy, "You're in," and I was like, "Hold on, if I say so." You mean you're going to take my word for it? We're talking about there's money involved here. You're just going to take my word for it? You don't need a corroborating witness or an affidavit or something? And he goes, no. And he gave me integrity back right there. Because he's taking my word for it. Integrity, you know, owning what I am, being true to myself. What I say is true and, and truth emanated from me. Now, that didn't last very long. You know, I probably lied a hundred times over the course of that weekend. But that moment in time reminded me of the fact that I can be, I can be trusted. I have possessed the power. And I don't remember losing integrity. I don't remember losing trust. I'm sure it happened in the middle of while I was drinking. But I started to get some of these back. And that was one of the greatest gifts because when we make amends, we're amending our life to be better people. The action of making amends is simply a display of I'm sorry, money returned, actually being a part of the very people's lives that we're saying we're sorry to. You know, and actually meaning it and actually living that way of life as a discipline, as a, as a course of action. And the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous gave me great examples of how to do that. And I started looking at the 10th step. And I love what the 10th step says. You know, you know, we have entered the realm of the world of spirit. And so I always like to think of this as like the idea that steps one through nine show me how to enter the world of the spirit. They show me how to enter into a presence and a conscious contact with God. You know, I love that. I'm not going to stay there. I step out. I have an opinion. I have a thought. I have a fear. I have a feeling. I have an insecurity. You know, I get a little too far away from meetings or a little too far away from prayer or a little too far away from the steps. I'm too busy to go speak somewhere. You know, I may have a number of 100 different reasons as to why I may separate myself from God. But if I get far enough away, it hurts. I have a low threshold for spiritual pain today. And what the steps have taught me to do, steps one through nine, is how to get back to God. 10, 11, and 12 keeps me in the game. 
you know? And I've learned a lot from steps 11. And most importantly, I think I've learned a lot from my wife. And I learned a lot from carrying this message. And I became a real, as you can tell, I have no problem coming up with words. Um, I started carrying the message of, of Alcoholics Anonymous in big book studies. when I was about three and a half, four years sober. And, uh, and I did those for a number of years. I got to participate, and I, it was always a great honor to participate, especially to go somewhere and to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous in a big book study format. And um, I got a little too highfalutin for my own good. I started to believe my own hype. And, uh, and, uh, and on, a, on my best day, I'm just another messenger. You know, I think some of the best messengers are the guys who show up early and are greeting people and you know, who've got a big book and a smile on their hand and have a real solution. And um, But I was at one place, uh, and we were carrying the message, and, uh, and, this, and this beautiful blonde walks up to me with a big book, and that's all I needed, a beautiful blonde and a big book. You know, it was just like, that was sexy as hell. And, um, and, uh, and, and, she, and she asked me a question, and I could, have been all, uh, I could have been all, like, up here with the answer. And I was just like, oh, okay, let's just shoot. The, I'll just come from here, experience strength and hope and the language of the heart. And, um, and we talked, and something told me I'm going to talk to her again. Now, she was on staff at the treatment center there, and, um, and, and that was in Sumter, South Carolina, and I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. And I was like, you yeah, know, the logistics are going to be difficult here, um, you know, because it meant delayed gratification, you know, which we hate, you know, and then delayed opportunities to see this person. And, uh, and, um, we ended up having dinner with a bunch of people that night. And I asked her to go smoke it back when I still smoked. And um, and uh, and then one of her coworkers comes out and he immediately starts to block me. You know, and uh, he was just lonely, and I didn't realize that at the time. But I felt this neat connection to her, and I knew I was going to talk to her again. And I, I called her the next day when we left town, and uh, and I stopped didn't stop talking to her. And um, and we fell in love by courting, courted, Google it, courted. <laughs> Something you don't see a, a whole lot of these days. We courted. We, uh, we, we fell in love with each other through our experience, strength, and hope. Our emotions connected with each other. It wasn't just a strictly physical thing. Because the physical part was always the easiest thing for me. It's so much easier just to hook up with somebody physically, have no heart, no emotion, and no spirit involved in it. Um, and we, we courted, and, I, and uh, I almost ruined the relationship by being a, being a coward. And I went back and I showed up at her daddy's house in Lake City, South Carolina, which is a small town. And he was the minister. So minister of a small town church. And I'm showing up there on a Sunday morning to beg for forgiveness. Please take me back. I, I almost threw this away. And I didn't know if he was going to meet me at the door with a gun or something. You know, we're in the South. I mean, that <laughs> ain't the weirdest thing you ever heard. And, um, and his mom, uh, his, uh, uh, he ended up going to church. And I sat there with her and her mom. And I shouldn't have been worried about dad. I should have been worried about mom. Um, because she was the one who had all the questions and, uh, and I, and I made a commitment that day that I was going to love, honor and cherish this woman and I was going to marry her and make her my wife. And, uh, just, we, we just celebrated six years together. Our marriage anniversary is, is in December, December 4th, uh, will be six years of marriage and, uh, my best friend and God picked her for me. You know, if I hadn't been doing what the program of Alcoholics Anonymous suggested, which is to carry this message and not to carry it is like some people begrudgingly carry a message. If you have to begrudgingly carry a message, you might want to look at the program you work with. You know, because what the program does is it instills a sense of like connection, it instills a sense of like purpose, it instills a sense of, of enjoyment. You know, then my book says a bunch of outlandish things like we absolutely insist on enjoying life. The, the best years of our existence lie ahead. Those are some outlandish things to say for for a, a book on recovery from a life threatening illness. You don't see those in the work in the book on cholera. You know, we don't get those in Ebola books. You know, we only get those in the book of Alcoholics Anonymous. So as I started practicing, you know, uh, uh, carrying this message a little by slowly, I realized that um, I had a, a certain enthusiasm, which is not always readily well accepted by a lot of people. Um, I've actually had people um, say, uh, this isn't a pep rally. And I'm like, yeah, it is. This is a pep rally. Because if newcomers could find no enjoyment in what's going on in these rooms, why would they come back? I know I can find misery in any bridge over here, in any, any bar over here, in any, any trap downtown. I know where to find pain. I know exactly how to find it, and I'm good at it. What I wasn't good at is, is identifying joy, not just pleasure. Because, see, I always under, I misunderstood the difference between pleasure and joy, true happiness, sense of purpose, not just being somebody who has a title, but actually having somebody who has a purpose. And my purpose is, today is to love my wife. My purpose today is to be a good son. My purpose today is to be a faithful employee. My purpose today is to be an example of Alcoholics Anonymous for anybody who may walk in and may want to know, how the hell am I supposed to escape this thing? You know, do you have anything better? Yes, we do. 
and it's more than sufficient. It's not just a substitute. It's a fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's a connection to a power greater than yourself, which will blow your mind. And in those moments when you're not sure, you get to watch other people's minds get blown. That's what I love about us getting together is that I may be having a tough day, but I can be around Jerry for a few minutes and have a powerful experience with him. I had the absolute most original conversation I've ever had in my entire life, bar none, outside this meeting before the meeting. It was great. Learned a whole lot about somebody I didn't know I was going to learn. You know, uh, it was a powerful experience. <laughs> but I had a cool experience. I get to be in the connection with the most amazing woman I've ever known in my entire life. I love my wife with everything in me. And it's not just a posture. It's not just a word. It's not just an idea. It's an experience. You know, I run into people regularly who aren't happily married. And I have to ask the question, why not? Not that I have any kind of corner or anything. I'm just, that's not my experience, you know? And, and I love what we do in here by uh, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. The whole point of this is to change my life. And that's what I get in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's what I get to share with you in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's what I get to bear witness to in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. But I think, and for me, it's really about service. It's giving it back. Giving it back. It's this idea that I'm uniquely qualified to carry the message to somebody Jerry can't reach. You know, I was homeless. I was hopeless and I was suicidal. And that isn't everybody's story. That was my story. Here I am 14, almost 15 years later, and I don't have a single regret for the last almost 15 years of my life. I had a lot before I got here. I've made a lot of mistakes in the last 14 plus years, but I've always been able to see them and capitalize on them as an opportunity for God to demonstrate his omnipotence. Um, Last thing I'll say, and I appreciate you all giving me the opportunity to get up here and shake my pom-poms because I love the show. <laughs> I really do. It's my favorite thing. to do. One of my favorite things to do in the whole world. I hate it before I do it, and then when I'm doing it, I was like, God, I love this. Um, <sighs> we grow in understanding and effectiveness. My wife, is; um, she gets God a whole lot better than I do. I, I struggle. I struggle with it. My mind gets a little too heavy. My mind races a little too much. I get a little too analytical. My wife, she gets real quiet. And, 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 and our life for the last couple of years has been a challenge because of uh, a lot of health-related issues. And she, I'll watch her get quiet with God, and I feel his presence. I feel it like a, like a cool chill on the skin. It's almost like a goosebumps thing. And, and, I, and I love the fact that, 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 um, that she's hungry for what it is that we offer here. Um, I may have uh, a little bit more than twice as much time in sobriety as she does, but boy, she gets got a whole lot quicker and a whole lot easier than I do. I have to work for it, and I'm grateful I can be in a room full of people, uh, some who have to work for it, but also some of them just seem to find God's face and be able to hold God's face in their hands and feel that presence and that, that grace and that radiance that, that emanates over it. And I'm glad that it doesn't, um, it, that it, it defies any... <sighs> Any naming convention, you know. Uh, my wife is a soft place to land, and I love being able to be connected to her. And one of the greatest gifts, other than my sobriety, has been meeting her. And um, and uh, and and I appreciate this opportunity, you know. And I, I'm I'm sh- as I share all this, I know Jerry loves his wife the same way, and so it's like I'm feeling this kind of cool, like you know, hey, bro, yeah, right, you know. And uh, I love that. In life isn't a veil of tears. I love that we do come in here and we absolutely insist on enjoying life. And that we'll give the book, you know, the last little word because I think it, it says a, a, an amazing amount of, of, of truth about, about what we have. You know, let's see this. My book tells me this. I can only clear the ground a bit if my testimony helps you to sweep away prejudice, enables you to think honestly encourages you to search diligently within yourself, then if you wish, you can join all of us on the broad road, the broad highway. With this attitude, you cannot fail. The consciousness of your belief is sure to come to you. My conscious understanding of God has evolved and changed, and, um, and I'm really, really grateful that uh, um, AA encourages us to seek diligently. And it's not just the big book that we're supposed to seek. There's the other books that come along. Uh, uh, we have copies of every major religion in our home. Uh, and, and all of them can be sought. Uh, there's, nobody's got this thing cor- figured out and cornered. You know, all we've got is our own experience. And I'm really grateful that um, I'll sit in a meeting, and when you hear somebody share honestly and passionately about their own experience, you can take their word for it. 
Yeah. It's when we start thinking a little too much and start sharing our infinite wisdom that the BS starts to blow out. So thank you, Jerry, for this opportunity. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.